Hello and welcome to Buddies Without Organs presents The K Files. I am Sean. My pronouns are he and him, and I am joined by Matt. Hello, uh, hi buddies. Yeah, my name's Matt. Um, my pronouns are also he him. And we are also joined by our friend down there in the Antipodes, Corey. Hello, good morning, buddies. Yep, my name is Corey J. White, and my pronouns are they, them. Well, we are recording on what is for myself and Matt a cold, cold January night. Um, for Corey, a I'm imagine sort of like quite warm January morning because of the the time zones and the globality of the earth and so on <laughs> um it's quite i'm not sure what the weather's like where you are up in the huddersfield map but down here on the south coast it's very appropriate uh to be recording uh something on this subject matter because it is a wonderful totally cloudless night sky out i went for a uh, stroll before we started recording and it was that beautiful kind that that just that beautiful grand eeriness of a winter night sky with the sparkly sparklies overhead uh <laughs> listening to and again getting into the mood for this listening to uh the kindred ep by burial which is something i try not to listen to too much because it makes me a bit emotional that one it's such mm. a such a oh it's just really good <laughs> isn't it um i'm not going to flare around trying to describe what how burial makes me feel right now though i'm certain that will be uh subject matter for a later episode so this is the k files and you might be wondering what the k files is going to be about the k files is us switching gear from our previous uh preoccupation with deleuze and trying to apply something similar to the work of mark fisher so this is going to be a different kind of series to what we did before. This is going to talk a lot about media. And it occurred to me today, actually, preparing to record this, but this is also going to be a podcast that's going to be very much about England and Britain, I think, because we are going to be talking so much about the stuff that Mark Fisher wrote about. And he write, obviously writes a lot about English science fiction television and British music and so on not exclusively by any means but i think this is going to be the lens is going to be changing what it's what its focus is um from what we've discussed over the last 12 months with uh, with um deleuze so this is going to be a very interesting series of experiments i think uh and i'm very much looking forward to seeing where this takes us uh you two how do you feel how do you where, where do you think we're going to go with the k files well, yeah, like for me, as someone who doesn't have, you know, the, the academic training or the academic background with uh, philosophy, I have found Mark Fisher to be extremely accessible. He was probably my first entry point into reading uh, theory and philosophy and from, from him on to other, uh, other texts uh, and writers. So, yeah, I'm really excited to get dug in, uh, you know, to some of his more obscure, uh, like, blog posts and writings and, yeah, just use that as a, a lens to look at, you know, both the media that he references and just other things that might occur to us as we uh, read through the post. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this project. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's, this, this, is a, this is an odd one for me, um, if only because, I, I'm, I mean, I'm very familiar with Mark's work. Um, no. And... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for any listeners that I suppose don't know, or I suppose also viewers at this point, see the change that we've got for um, this season of the BWO is that we're also coming to your eyeballs as well as your ears. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I wrote a book about Mark um, a couple of years ago and um, edited uh, Mark's final lectures for repeat books. Um, and, but despite that foreknowledge, this wasn't my idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, I think it's for that reason that I'm actually really excited about this. It's like um, it, it it it's not something that I would have thought to have done precisely because it's almost it's almost obvious. But it's but I'm kind of I'm really excited to actually read Mark with friends again. It's been like a long time, years really. I think since kind of had that opportunity. Um, so yeah, it, and it's and it's and it's strange in a way because. 
I think almost with with someone as difficult as Deleuze that we kind of looked at for most of last year or all of last year, um, it, it's it's so difficult that you kind of do have to plan ahead. Whereas Mark's work seems to offer like a slightly, it's more accessible as, as, as Corey rightly said, but then also at the same time that feels like it's more open in a way. There's there's uh, there's more to I don't know. There's 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 more to sort of explore outwards. There's not there's not this wealth of secondary literature we can draw on to confirm our readings or whatever of this sort of stuff. And that, that that's kind of um, makes for a a more exploratory podcast, which is I'm both kind of nervous about and also really excited about. So, um, yeah, it, it, this is a this is a really nice start to 2022, I think. <laughs> uh, yes, it's my uh, my responsibility. All of this, I'm afraid. Um, but the the thought came to me when I was out walking with my camera. And I was listening. I was listening to Pie Corner Audio's most recent album. And I was taking pictures of this mysterious substation looking thing uh a town over and uh against a lovely late autumn early winter sky and don't ask me why but the thought just flashed into my head that it'd be really good to do some podcast thing about mark fisher and Mm. um yes and it's interesting as well that um over the the years i have been podcasting because as listeners to it i'll put we'll do pluggables at the end of it but listeners of this podcast might be familiar with me from weird signal uh mark fisher has always kind of been a presence in the podcasting that i've done um and indeed the um curiously and this was completely unintentional i'm aware that people might not think it was unintentional or might not believe us when we say that um we are recording this debut episode of the k files on the anniversary of mark's death and indeed, the first episode of Weird Signal was again unintentionally, coincidentally recorded on the one year anniversary of Mark's death. And the day that he died, my I my discovery of that was me sitting down in my living room to start the Weird and the Eerie, checking Facebook on my phone just as I did so reflexively, and the first thing I see being that Mark Fisher was dead. Um, so yeah, it feels, um, in a way that he has always kind of been, I mean, he's been, his, his work has been a presence, you know, in my life for, for years and he's always been either in the background or in the foreground of the podcast thing that I've recorded. Um, not so much with, um, Bodies Without Organs, I think maybe because we did have a different focus. Um, but he has always, he has always been a presence there somehow. So it feels like a high time to really, really shift a gear and focus in on him. And, uh, yeah, because, uh, for, for me myself, I've been aware of so much of his stuff I haven't read and wanting to have an excuse to do so at last, you know, to, or to just to have something, you know, in my life. It means I have to actually read a lot more of him, more than just like the books we've all read, like Capitalist Realism and Ghosts of My Life. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited for this project's exploratory potential um, as well. And uh, again, this is, I think this is probably going to bring all of us into slightly more comfortable territory than maybe we have been dealing with Deleuze. Because a lot, like, we are going to be doing just a fair bit of media criticism in this because of the, uh, again, just because of the, the nature of the subject matter. A lot of us is going to be talking about films and TV and so on. Um, and I think with that, actually, we probably ought to mention what it is we're going to be talking about today. We are going to be talking about a very, very brief blog post and the Hyperstitions blog. And it was, Matt, your idea that we cover this. It went up on uh, February the 6th, 2005. Uh, a very short piece entitled Megalithic Astropunk, uh, which is surprisingly hard to find when you Google it. So we'll just have to put it in the show notes. And this, we, what we're going to do is... Um, we are just going to assume that you, listener and or viewer, have read this because, again, it's really short. Like, it's less than five minutes reading. You can do you can do this. We believe in you. Although what we might do as well is put out just a little recording of one of us 
just reading it, they'll go out alongside this. And this short, fun, punchy little blog post is to do with the 1970s children's TV serial, Children of the Stones. So I have lots and lots and lots I want to talk about here. Um, I'm sure that we all do, in fact. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to throw this open to whoever wants to, whoever wants to go first for this, actually. Um, well, I, I, maybe I wondered what could maybe set the stage, at least, is maybe talk about where, why this post, maybe, why this blog? Um, maybe give a bit of background as to what's going on here. Um, if that sounds good with you both, anyway. Yes. Yep. Um because I guess that <laughs> when I started, it, 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 as you, you, Sean is you're you're very correct that this is a very short post, but at the same time, as soon as you sort of start these first few paragraphs, it's there's a sense that you're slightly jumping in at the deep end because um, <laughs> it starts off pretty intensely um, when when Mark's kind of using this quite sort of quasi high theoretical language that seems quite obtuse, um, but I think that's mostly because. He's using neologisms and concepts that he himself invented um, mm. for himself and, and, and for others. And I guess central to that is this concept of hyperstition, um, which is not only central to this post, but it's also it comes from um, the hyperstition blog. Um, so I think, yeah, but first things first, I thought I'd kind of try and situate this blog um in a kind of short history, very very short history, because there's a there's a lot to talk about, and we've not got well. I mean, we've got all the time in the world, but for the sake of our own patience, um, <laughs> I think the the hyperstition blog is really interesting. Um, it's not you know Mark's best known for his K punk blog, um, but it was it wasn't the only one. It wasn't wasn't the only online project that he had. Um, and the Hyperstition blog was sort of founded in 2004, so about a year after K-Punk, or maybe even the same year, as a more of a collaborative writing project and a writing space for various people that had been part of the CCRU. Um, for those that don't know, the CCRU is uh, was otherwise known as the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit. because This is kind of the onion of, of, of the sort of K-Punk um, family tree almost. They're going to have to sort of peel back a few layers here. Um, the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit was this um, this para academic research group that was populated by various students at the University of Warwick and elsewhere. Um, it wasn't really confined to the university, and it wasn't made up exclusively of students from that institution, but it did function in its orbit. Um, the timeline of the CCLU was quite complex for this reason, something that its members, I think, often embraced. And it's a it's a product of a, this cross pollination between institutions. So you have Warwick University on the one hand, which had and continues to have a quite prestigious philosophy department, which at that time featured academics like Keith Ansel Pearson and Nick Land, um, and together they both taught um, contemporary continental philosophy, which was stuff like Alain Badiou, um, Gilles Deleuze, who we're now quite familiar with, uh, Michel Henri, and Francois Laruelle. And this is all in the mid nineties. Um, and around that time, Warwick was joined by Sadie Plant, who had moved there from the University of Birmingham, who, where she brought a bunch of her students with her, including Mark Fisher, who had previously been a part of um, another sort of research group called Switch, which featured people like Stephen Metcalf and Angus Carlyle, neither of whom went to Warwick, but I think were also involved in the CCRU. You kind of see how complicated this gets. And... Soon enough, the CCU kind of becomes this quite sprawling online cyber network of renegade academics who collectively produced all these different texts and graphic artworks and audio essays and performances. And later that kind of that 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 network expands even further and you have people like Kojo Eshen, who became um, a sort of a fan of their work at first and then later contributed to publications and zines and things. And I'm, I'm kind of rattling through all this if only because I think it's important to understand how fundamental this ethos of networking and collaboration was, um, but which wasn't strictly academic, and nor was it sort of fully independent either. 
And it's largely for that reason, I think, that in around 2003, most of the CCIU's main players had sort of completed their PhDs or had somewhat notorious mental breakdowns and moved on to other <laughs> places and other projects. Um, but in reality, you know, that, that the networks simply changed shape. So people got more into blogging. Um, and it was at that time that an even more sort of decentralized blogosphere came in being, which was um, fully independent of any academic institution, actually, which allowed for kind of this new influx of, well, an influx of new blood, which included people like Reza Negostani. And this is where the hyperstition blog comes in. So um, it's this sort of post-CCIU collaborative space. Um, and Reza Negostani posted a lot there. Um, most of his posts were later sort of siphoned off and transformed into his first book, um, 2008 Cyclonopedia. But Mark Fisher was also a frequent poster there. And there were other CCIU alumni like Nick Land, Robin Mackay, Anna Greenspan, Steve Gooden and others. And whether that's, you know, that's either writing posts or just being an active part of the comment, comment section. And hyperstition is kind of the crowning sort of, the, well, the, for one thing, the title of this, the, the sort of name of this blogosphere is, is an acutely CCRU concept. Um, I think we've already said before recording today that we, we could probably dedicate a whole episode to that concept. But I think for now, it's at least worth breaking it down in 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 maybe the probably the most the, the simplest of terms. So hyperstition is clearly related to the word superstition. And we can define superstition as a sort of belief that makes the uh, a belief that makes fictions real. So mm. if I step on a crack and it, my mother breaks her back, then I, I weave a web of coincidence and causation between two events. I make the fiction real. I'm the one who makes these co these, these connections and constructs a narrative out of them. And unbelief is central here too. This kind of the, the the rational part of my brain might be wholly aware of the fact that my mother's broken back is is a, is is a, is a coincidence and um, nothing to do with my stepping on cracks. Nevertheless, the narrative I've constructed, this this vague possibility can still be affecting. Like so, to the extent that I might still feel guilty. You know, the the facts might not care about your feelings, but it's sometimes also true that your feelings don't care about the facts. <laughs> So hyperstition kind of goes a step further. It's 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 a, instead of a fiction that makes its uh, it's it's a fiction that makes itself real, uh, which we could say is like an urban legend or a meme, or something like the Mandela effect. The um, the, the 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 I that is central to superstition is displaced, and suddenly it's maybe not clear what sort of agency is acting on this belief to the extent that. Um, certain ideas start to circulate through a culture, maybe without origin or without the application of like a conscious human agency. And this is something that we find so often in horror films. And this is kind of, this is what the CCIU was sort of most famous for. And it's something that carries on in this hyperstition blog and especially in this post where um, I guess you could say that horror films in general um might be one way of articulating certain worries or anxieties or fears that we as a society have but haven't yet given a proper form or a name to, but which seemingly sort of emerge of their own accord. And it's also, and I think it's, you know, it's particularly important where these fears emerge from. There's an air of Philip K. Dick here, that, that, that famous line from Vallis, where he says that the symbols of the divine initially show up in the trash stratum. And the same is true here for, for Mark Fisher, especially, but, you know, also the broader CCIU and the, the other members of the hyperstition block. Um, it's often the case that, you know, some of the most profound insights into our cultural moments or our contemporary structures of feeling can be drawn out from our cultural trash. And this is why Mark begins this post by focusing on um, Pulp Fiction. He writes, far from being reducible to the popular or worse still, the populist, Pulp is essentially propagative. It lurks and spreads in the paradoxical spaces, dark but lurid, mass marketed but intensely intellectual, beyond the gaze of the media big other and its ruthlessly imposed pop ontology of common sense. 
Such spaces are rare to the point of near extinction in the hyper-bright, hyper-visible malls of contemporary postmodern entertainment culture, where everything is not only known, but knowing. So it's for this reason that Mark turns to these near-forgotten 70s BBC serials that kind of haunted his youth, like old Doctor Who episodes, or things like The Prisoner, or Sapphire and Steel, um, The Stone Tape, or in the case of this post, Children of the Stones. And this this stony theme is telling as well, I think. Um, Mark's got a really great post on the stone tape. that I'm, I'm not sure if that was just on his blog or also made it into um, one of his books. Either way, maybe that's another something else to pin in front of the time. Um, anyway, to get to the point, I think, is that it's 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 here that we kind of, in this kind of stoniness, this kind of this, this strange agency of, of materiality that we encounter... Um, these strange sorts of affects, these kind of hyperstitional affects that are not produced by subjects, but by objects. Um, so a kind of pop cultural materialism where our agency is put in tension by the strange forces that emanate from our surroundings. So, you know, that um, Nietzsche often made the point about food. You know, he, he sort of the first, the, he, a lot of Nietzsche's philosophy was written around that time that the, the phrase, you are what you eat, first came into sort of circular, well, maybe not that phrase in particular, but that idea at least came into circulation. So he has this great line about how the way that German philosophers think probably can probably be explained by their steady diet of sausages. <laughs> um but in our contemporary consumerist society, you know, we find ourselves tucking into a lot more than just sausages. <laughs> so Fisher's question, I think, is, you know, we're not just here, but I guess in general, and I guess maybe this is something that is kind of distilled really nicely in this post. That I'm kind of interested to see what you guys think of this. But it, one of his questions here is, you know, what does it say about a gener his generation um, that they were raised on a steady diet of occulted, murky, trashy television programmes? And what does our more clinical and hyper bright media diet tell us about ourselves today? I had a conversation with uh, with a friend on Saturday um, about this subject. Actually, we were talking because he he lent me a copy of a book, which I'm not, I'm not actually going to be referring to. It turns out, um, but we were talking about the '70s thing, you know, and it's how it intersects with. Um, ontological culture and uh, Fortean culture as well, for that matter. And he made a very, very salient uh, point where he said that um, all of these upsetting um, kids shows from the 70s, right? You know, Doctor Who, Children of the Stones, uh, the, Tom the Tomorrow People, all of that. In terms of its actual genuine disturbingness, all of them pale in comparison to Jimmy Savile to uh, the actual, real, mainstream, good, polite society TV of the era, right? Mm. Um, that And he suggests that part of the interest in, uh, or the resurgence in the, of, uh, of interest in stuff like Old Doctor Who or Children of the Stones and so on, of this act of like, cultural reclamation, which has been kind of pioneered by people who grew up with it in some way or the other um, and then propagated it to younger generations um, is almost an act of like vindication that sort of like us spooky kids were never the ones that you ought to be worried about, you know? Um, and actually sort of like um, strange echoes of this coming down, uh, coming down through the years. Uh, again, not only a re um, another thing that is significant about today is that shortly before recording it was announced that the Queen has stripped uh, Prince Andrew of his uh, military honours and royal patronages because of his connection with a sex abuse uh, scandal. So this is the, um, which is, which almost at this point almost feels like uh, such a thoroughly English thing to have happen, you know, sort of like another uh, major establishment figure caught up with something incredibly nasty and seedy like this. Um, Yes, and it's uh, but yeah, I think that I think there's definitely some truth to that. This idea that um, in the in this in this media which has this shadowiness to it and this general you know vibes of the weird and the eerie, this stuff that was you know was regard was regarded in some way or the other as somewhat suspect, like it receives this vindication by the discovery of what the what what the respectable uh, media artefacts actually were involved with, what was actually going on behind the scenes with them. 
It's like the I'd actually never thought of putting that together before, but it 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 it, it feels like that line that's in this post, right? Where it's I mean, I guess we're kind of I don't want to jump right into the middle of it, but he talks about these um these like these pulp villains that you get in these pulp fictions that that they're not. They're not straightforward. This is a quote: not straightforwardly malevolent monsters, but they can be beamingly altruistic administrators of the pleasure principle. And what, yeah, what does that describe if not a kind of Jimmy Savile, or even the, or a Boris Johnson, or even you know the, yeah, the sort of the the strangely sort of placating presence of monarchy. Well, yes, think- exactly. I think Sean just did a, a total strato analysis of the libidinal material nature of power that Mark Fisher mentions in the post. Just right there. Just, yeah, nailed it. Yeah. Well, we can stop now. Uh, yeah, wrap it up then. <laughs> um, yeah, Christ. Um, yeah. Um, okay, shall we start? Uh, I think we should start talking about the meat of this a little bit in earnest. Um, Corey. I think you have something that you want to talk about, and I think that thing is something to do with William Burroughs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, like, do you, before before you do, do can we? Are we just ignore? I just want to acknowledge it because that might seem like a bit of a non sequitur. Um, that uh, there's this line here in the um, in the post, which I'll just read. Uh, Children of the Stones is about Petros, the black hole vampire god of this in- of disintensification and intensive death whose hunger for star energy is similarly diagrammed in Burroughs' Nova trilogy. There's also a reference slightly later on in the post to um, the villain of the piece, uh, the villain of the piece um, m- are being described here as an agent of uh, Burroughs' notion of control, just to, mm. just to set you up there a little bit, Corey. Well, maybe, maybe there's some more setting up, actually, because... I know, uh, at least in terms of talking about Petros, should we talk what about we... Children of the Stones? Yeah, actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you're quite right. Um, what do you? What? Because I mean, we all kind of watched it before Christmas. What did you? We haven't talked about, about Children of the Stones yet, have we? That's a... <laughs> uh, okay. It's, this is the kind of the problem, right? This it's a post that gets so into the meat of things so quickly that I think even we maybe that's my own fault for that slightly dense introduction. But we've it's hard to dip your toe into this. You are kind of immediately like dunked sort of witch trial was my it was my own fault for not being a good podcast dictator because i do actually have like <laughs> in my notes written in front of me saying that like we need to talk about children of the stones and the 70s <laughs> of it all uh sub point sub point a plot summary uh okay cory you go first then in telling us what you thought about children of the stones before we move on to william uh, burroughs okay um yeah no i thought like one of the good things about like cheap sci-fi is like, or I guess like cheap sci-fi can go one of two ways. It can either just look really cheap and terrible or it can force the creators to come up with really interesting ideas and interesting ways around the budgetary constraints. And, you know, that's kind of what I felt was happening here is that it's like just really weird and spooky and eerie and like it does that with very little in the way of like effects or, um, or uh, yeah good acting or anything much <laughs> but it's just like a really interesting story and it told yeah you know, yeah told really well for the time yeah i remember actually something i read in uh, the english heretic uh book from repeater well i don't i don't think he was talking about the stone tape in particular but he was talking about like stuff from the 70s where he said something like look in the same way you wouldn't really like hold it against it but the special effects look bad you shouldn't hold the acting against it either you know <laughs> there were you know it was a kids show it was made you know sort of like yeah it, well actually that's it just it you know it was a kids show it was made in the 70s it wasn't really meant to look or feel anything other than how it does mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's sort of the that's that's like the the almost the 70s charm right it's all a bit amdram like of, of atmosphere but then at the same time like also deeply occulted and sinister that you can like it can be so something that's so mundane in terms of its production mm. but actually has this like really un like genuinely unsettling sort of themes or or events or well at least for this one too i always think i think the soundtrack is just so bizarre mm. for a kind of 
for any TV show. It's the sort of thing you'd sort of like um kind of under the skin sort of contemporary art house horror vibe, not like a seventies yeah TV show for the BBC. Uh, for ITV, which makes it even weirder. Was it ITV? I know, oh, right? Wow. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's HTV. What is HTV? HTV must be. Well, it, it must it be just ITV. before ITV, right? <laughs> No, it was it was produced by it was produced by HTV, which um, but and broadcast oh. on ITV. HTV being now being ITV Wales and West, previously known as Harlech Television. I am just reading this off Wikipedia. Um, and you actually, yeah, and and indeed, Mark has mentioned the music here, saying, and I'm just going to read this quote: uh, "The thing that children who saw the serial when it was first broadcast are liable to retain most powerfully in their spinal cord body memory is the music, harrowing eternal atonal chants reminiscent of Penderecki and Leggetti, which made the looming close-ups of megaliths scream of millennia-old panic. Like the young viewers of Doctor Who, the audience of Children of the Stones was infected by sounds far more disturbing and deranged than anything Rock has ever come up." With and he's he, not wrong he's not wrong it is um yeah i do yeah but yes we should we will acknowledge though um like it is it, it is weird and it is eerie but there is also just it is also charming and funny like uh not always intentionally um <laughs> just because of the circumstances of its creation and yes it's very stagey it um but it's, it's also absolutely delightful i will say uh that the thing that does just make it tremendously funny is at the ad break and god knows why this is here like i don't know if like there was like <laughs> like a continuity announcer would speak over this but there's always a point when it comes to the ad break it says end of part one with the camera doesn't cut away it just keeps on focused on whoever spoke last on their face <laughs> and it will just hold for about 10 odd seconds of them just like trying not to look at the camera and not always succeeding in not looking at the camera either <laughs> <laughs> which is absolutely oh it's beautiful yeah um yeah it makes you think they filmed it live or something <laughs> they didn't, but it's yeah it's like that weird it's like an weird snl breaking thing it's really i actually i actually sent um i i sent a cl- um the the youtube of the first um episode of this to a friend uh who just sort of like we just saw like a little recording at the back of his iphone saying what are they saying here? Like, it's completely impenetrable. What's the, the saying of points here? Like, no, it isn't. But listen to, yeah, fuck, that was what they're saying. I'm sorry. But like, <laughs> it's saying something like, you know, qu- it's a very good chance that all of this is either the first or second take uh, of each scene because, you know, they, di- they wouldn't have had budget for more than that. And that actually, like, something Doctor Who, like, especially like old creaky Doctor Who is notorious for is they would just go with like the first take sometimes and which is why you have all of these like um wonderful moments of people just tripping up over the lines or missing their mark uh because they just they uh, not i don't want to say they didn't care it was just sort of like well can't do it again though can we um <laughs> william hart maybe budgetary like you literally don't have the film stock maybe. yeah like william mm. like william hart in particular the first doctor as as time went on and his memory started to go basically and he would there, there are these moments where he does just trail off and there'll be like 10 seconds or so of just hmm, <laughs> <laughs> moments until someone else like just jumps ahead to their lives as we were saying doctor um and these were like (laughs) oh it's just it's just really quite fun and jolly please watch the uh, children of the stones (laughs) but yeah this is um yeah, I will. We'll put a link to it too, actually. In the oh, so long, yeah, so long. Yeah, yeah. The the whole series is available on YouTube, which yeah. is quite special, actually. The uh... yeah, and it should be said though, like um, your level of enjoyment of it is going to depend on like your your mental bandwidth when it comes to this. <laughs> like, um, I, like uh, I'm not being funny. Like, it is it is a slog stuff like this. Like, if you don't have like the bug for it, like this was like. In preparation for this was when I finally sat down and watched Children of the Stones. And I tried twice before to do so. Um, and and I was only able to get through it by watching it like over a week in chunks at lunchtime, basically. Um, because it like it's just otherwise it would just get too much because it is quite uh, yeah, just just the the full the taken it taken in too strong a dose, like the faults just can get a bit overwhelming but i imagine it'd be something be very very fun to watch the party remember those um 
I mean, yeah, I remember that the first time I think I watched this was a few years ago. It was in some the it was in Robin Mackay's front living room in Cornwall, actually. Um, and I remember as both after it, it's about I think altogether it's about two and a half hours long, and felt with sort of a glass of like a bottle of wine between us, just a little bit delirious by the end. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> takes its toll. There are some delicious. We will get back onto the theory in a bit, but we have to keep talking about this a little bit more. But like in particular, the moment where um, oh god, what's his name? The villain. Uh, I've got his name here. Uh, Hendrick. Hendrix. Hendrick. When he um, is performing his ritual and he's st- sat there on his throne which rotates before the beam of energy shoots up into the black hole. And there's just a fact he visibly is just shifting it round on his feet. It's, <laughs> well, hold to God, the hand so it doesn't like fall over as he does so. Oh, it's delicious. It's delightful. Well, okay, no, we have to summarise the plot and we have to get back on, we have to get back on track. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's a story which is, quite simple but also weirdly complicated at the same time like surprisingly complicated when you actually get down to the stru- to the structure of it and i think that's one of the reasons why it is so memorable because once you if you do stick with it and get through to the end like you will be su- pr- pleasantly surprised at how solid the plot actually is and like how it's expecting a lot from its audience, actually. Mm. And like the things like the production values and the acting don't help it in that regard. But you get a story which is actually surprisingly sophisticated in terms of the narrative complexity um, of the piece. And, and what it's about is about um, this, this young boy and his uh, father, who is an astrophysicist, uh, who moved to this village. I think it's called Milbury uh, in the series, but it's filmed in Avebury in Wiltshire of the Avebury Circle. Um, so, which is a issue for people who don't know, is a village um, which was just built within a stone circle. Uh, it's not too far. It's about like an hour's drive away from Stonehenge. It's rough. It's, so it's in like the same area of the country. Uh, it's a much better. It's a much better like visit than Stonehenge, though. To be perfectly honest, because you don't have to pay because it's like it's literally just a village is there. So you just go to this village and then you just wander around and you can touch and climb on the stones and so on because there's unlike Stonehenge there's no way they could keep you away from them because the village is just in the midst of it and it is one of the weirdest places you'll ever visit it's absolutely fantastic it's really really cool to go there actually like it's it's, it's, it's awesome uh, so he they they moved to this uh, to to this village I'm not quite sure why he's gone there to do astrophysical research I can't remember if a reason was ever given for this but he does so and basically what they discover is is there is this separation in the village between people who one might describe as ordinary people and then the happy people of the village who are just... um, Well, again, to quote from Mark Fisher here, he says that... um, uh, God, where is it? There we go. Uh, the serial opens by presumably self-consciously echoing invasion of the body snatchers, children of the damned, Quatermass II, the Wicker Man, and the Stepford Wives, inducting its two leads, astrophysicist Adam Brake and his son Matthew, into a near-closed community of happy people. One of the great services such fictions provided was to make its young viewers intensely suspicious, both of happiness as an emotional state and of those who proffer it as a libidinal political goal. Which I think is a, a really, really interesting statement here. And what they discover mm. over the course of the serial is that the stones of the stone circle are aligned somehow with a black hole uh, deep in outer space and that a certain cycle of events has actually been repeating there through the centuries um, quite archetypal in some ways there's the arrival of the two travellers to the village there is the the barber surgeon who is uh crushed by the stones and there is the the high priest the magus who is leading this community and the, what they seem to be doing is they transmit their um i suppose what i mean this is where we're going to start getting things the weeds of it you know what is it they actually are giving up to the black hole god you know it's some kind of um free will i suppose would be the easiest way of of passing it but it's a a certain kind of psychic depth is what they sacrifice to it in exchange for this simple-minded happiness that they then enjoy would you agree with that Hmm. yeah i mean i almost think it's 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 
I mean, this, yeah, this is something else. This is, I was going to say, it's something probably to unpack, but I feel like they're just giving themselves up to power, right? Like a kind of indeterminate power without origin, almost, as if it's just they're just seduced by energy. Um, but yeah, I mean, the I mean, the implications of that get quite weedy and metaphysical quite quickly. So <laughs> that's not really a simple statement to make. But yeah, but that's 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 also kind of the power of it too, right? This kind of the indeterminacy of what they're actually giving themselves up to. I think mm. I have... So the focus of my notes here is on talking about... It's basically, it is talking in quite a lot of detail about my ideas around ley lines and stone circles, uh, which I'm going to hold off on for a bit because I think that's actually a really good jumping off point to part, handing the reins over to Corey for a bit because I know you have stuff prepared about burrows and control and I think it is very relevant to what we were just talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing that's uh, like readily apparent if you read uh, a lot of Burroughs writing is that he seems to um, perceive the universe itself to be an inherently hostile place, perhaps even anti-human. Um, but then to say it's anti-human, it might sound kind of like cosmic horror, but I think there's still a, a distinction there. Uh, like cosmic horror, you can kind of sum it up with two two main ideas the first being that there are horrors in this universe that are literally incomprehensible and trying to comprehend them will drive you insane and the second idea is that humanity is insignificant like we are completely beneath the notice of the elder gods and other entities and if they do kill us it'll just be as a side effect of some other action that they're taking like maybe they're just um, taking a shit and then you know an entire country dies because they don't realize that people are <laughs> under their under their butthole <laughs> <laughs> um but so then like with burrows it's it's uh, not so impersonal as that like with burrows it's as though the evil recognizes us like intimately and deeply um and it even like maybe recognizes things in us that we would rather not admit were there uh, it's an intensely personal hatred that's aimed directly at you and it can emanate from anyone or even anything in your vicinity um, so that means that in burrow's writing the forces of controls the forces of control um might be ubiquitous and largely arbitrary but if they choose to target you they're going to target you with all of the intensity of someone bearing a very personal grudge. So with Burroughs, control is stifling, dehumanizing, even anti-human. Um, and it's a kind of a system that must be battled at every junction. In contrast, what we see with Children of the Stones is a seemingly benevolent system of control. Um, so beyond Hendrix's or Hendrix's need to feed on star energy, he does seem genuinely concerned for his little human pets like he he, th he seems to want what's best for them and like even though they are kind of hollowed out um through the process they are still like outwardly happy um it doesn't so like it might not seem like an anti-human system of control but it is thoroughly anti-individual um and I think, I don't know if Sean might want to talk about this, but that kind of seems to tie into uh, British folk horror uh, and, and even hot fuzz, like the overriding importance of the greater good. The greater good. Yes. <laughs> the, um, I mean, for me, when it comes to, when it comes to like the foundational, the fundamental character of folk horror, right? It seems, I mean, and I'm certain that's something that people, you know, can and will uh argue intensely you know sort of like for for a definition of it but for me what's going on here and where this plugs into folk horror is for me what the, the fundamental theme for of folk horror for me is this notion that within the parochial there is something cosmic or at least something radically other and I think this is where, like, we can't just pass over the endearing folkiness of Children of the Stones. In fact, it takes place in sort of like a charming little village. And, you know, there's the, the village school and the village library, uh, the village doctor. There's the Morris dancing and so on. Uh, in the same way, but, you know, in The Wicker Man, you have all of these charming features 
of you know small uh, the small town life and indeed with hot fuzz as well or you know um but there is this um familiar folky charming pleasantness to the whole thing but under the surface there's something like i said either cosmic or radically other and obviously with children of the stones it was both obviously it's uh but um it is very literally cosmic you know this is a village built within a stone circle which has a literal physical connection with a alien black hole god <laughs> you know um and i think so yes it does um it, it really does kind of encompass these themes really really uh, neatly and again something else and 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 you're really right there Corey, as well that a figure that often appears in these um films or these tv shows is the benevolent controller uh and you know here it's it's hendrick there um in in um hot fuzz i really like that you brought up in hot fuzz there's uh, i think his name is jim broadbent's character and uh the village council and uh obviously the great like figure of this is lord Summerisle in the wicker man who again sort of like he seems like an affable charming uh gentleman and you know very similar character the character to hendrick i imagine there is some kind of like i imagine there is influence one way or the other i can't quite remember which would have come out first um uh, i think possibly this might have come out before the work around but that doesn't matter um and they're archetypal figures anyway um but both of them do like you said do seem to genuinely have you know have a beneficence to them so they care about their people and they don't necessarily want to do the you know, sort of like the more unpleasant sides, the more unpleasant duties here. But they do them all the same because they believe it is sincerely for the greater good. You know, sort of like Lord Summerisle. There's a very like um, I mean, I lo- I love The Wicker Man very very dearly. It is an ex- it's an exceptional film. And one of the very a moment I've always found quite disturbing is when he tries to comfort Constable Howie by reminding him that so well reminding him that well you as a christian should appreciate that this is martyrdom you are you are <laughs> going to sit with the saints for this you know this doesn't happen anymore you're gonna be burned by the pagans right uh, <laughs> and the thing is like he does seem to mean it like he does want to sort of be a source of comfort here and again with um with hendrick you know this it doesn't seem to be suggesting that sort of like he um he does seem to think that this is just going to make everything better. But at the same time of all of this, and this is why I think it is important to think of these as figures who are darkly reflective of establishment, real life establishment figures, is that, I mean, they can say that. You know, they can say that and act like, well, you know, this is this hurts me as much as it hurts you. But you're still the lord of the manor and I'm not. You know, like, you're still the creepy old guy hanging around with the kids. You know, it's, um, there's, there's limits to this. And I think it's, it's, um, this, and I think the truth here is, you know, that, that beneficence is its own, can be its own form of control, surely. Hmm. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll pick back up, um, from exactly there, what you were saying, um, so I think, like, even if, like, Hendrick's apparent benevolence does act as a as a good form of control, um, if you are a control addict, um, it's something that Burroughs could never consider because for Burroughs, I think, like, loss of autonomy or self would be completely unconscionable. Um, so, like, he, he sees control of any sort, I feel, as uh, as always being an attack by an, a hostile alien presence. Um so then uh, if you take the um, the di- dichotomy between hostile and benevolent forces of control, um, that kind of made me think of Matrix Resurrections versus the original movie. Like in the original movie, Cypher was like villainous because he was willing to sell out his friends in order to regain entry into the Matrix and like experience an easy life. Um, and in Resurrections, it's kind of shown that that, that choice to remain inside is understandable. Like it's not necessarily a good choice to make. It's not necessarily helpful or healthy, but it is something that, you know, you can understand. Um, And I think like that part of the film is really timely because like in the wake of the pandemic and onrush and the onrushing climate crises we're likely to face in the coming years, um, 
a lot of people will prefer to stick their heads in the sand. Um, like why walk away from a Mellis when you can happily watch your Disney Plus, play Fortnite, get food delivered to your door by underpaid gig workers and forget about the suffering child uh, imprisoned in the city's dungeon. Um, like these dystopian dreams of a metaverse peddled by Zuckerberg and others are simply the logical endpoint end point of this tendency towards a blissful ignorance. It will like literally obfuscate the myriad very real problems of the very real world for this kind of like clean and sterile corporate reality like it's they're definitely coming from it thinking they're offering benevolent control but you know i think to many of us it seems horrifying um all right so back to children of the stones the show was made for kids um and so because of that like the the effects of the hypification process um, that we see are, pr are kind of skewed towards, you know, like childish endeavours. Like we see that it makes them creepily happy, sociable, nonviolent, and and for some reason very, very good at maths. Um, <laughs> but then it, it leaves the question of like how would it actually affect the adults? We don't really see that much apart from like the, the surface level happiness. Um, so like I'm left wondering like how would it alter their behaviour and their beliefs? Like would the process like quash like queerness, for instance? Like um, there's, no, there's no sense of what would happen and I think that would be something really interesting to explore. Um, and then like the other part of it that I can't help but thinking of is in the modern day would a similar like process turn people into happy, like perfect happy workers ready to slave away for capital. Um, like it's, it's kind of easy to imagine that in our age of economic precarity and like wealth inequality, someone might undergo a process like this if it meant that they were freed from depression and anxiety that we like that are increasingly um you know suffered because of the uh i guess the pressures of society um and you know that maybe they'd go through the process if they were guaranteed a job at the other side or maybe just like a place in an actual community because capitalism has done a great job of atomizing our society so then I start thinking about technocratic control and how every week there's a new startup that's planning to use machine learning and invasive apps to make people like better, more efficient workers. And it's tied to a per pervasive idea that Fisher definitely um, like mentioned in his writings, uh, particularly capitalist realism, like that whatever is wrong with a person is like a purely a personal failing and not, a, not a, a reflection of increasingly hostile social systems, and B, it's fixable if we have the right data. Now, Burroughs would find this horrifying. It's like I think he'd see it as a, the perfection of a hostile and anti-human system of control. Um, and, you know, what would he have us do? He'd have us smash the control images, smash the control machine. Um, in, in Naked Lunch, Burroughs wrote, um, you see... Control can never be a means to any practical end. Control can never be a means to anything but more control, like junk. Like, so the people at the top, they've become control addicts, fueled by technocratic ideology and bullshit beliefs like long-termism. They all see themselves as Hendrix, but above it all, oh, yeah, they, they all see themselves as Hendrix or Petros, um, being above the rest of us. And, and they think that they're controlling us for our own good. Um, you know, they don't care what we have to say in the matter. Yes, and I think you're very right to connect this with um, with corporate information control and monitoring. Uh, I mean, because you're precise, and I and you're quite right to draw to 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 mention the uh, Vazuk as well, right? Because that, what Facebook was 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 doing you know all of this time with um was gathering our you know was algorithmically gathering data about us in order to try and direct and command our emotional responses to, to our stimuli uh and doing all of this under not necessarily saying this well, actually no, i suppose yeah no the whole thing was saying was all of this is making us all happier and more connected and more sociable right we're actually just all it was doing was funneling us into ever more um niche theatres of control right mm. um and part of me almost thinks that like 
the scrappiness and the low production values of something like Children of the Stones. And the fact that it is so long and quite like boring means it's resistant to being processed away, you know, by mm. by um by the machines in some ways. Because like it's something that you can't really all you could do would be to try and file away the things that make it distinctive to make it less less distinct, you know. Um I'm conscious of time and I think we probably all I think we probably all still have quite a lot we want to talk about so we might try and rattle our way through things a little bit um actually speaking of time I have some things I want to talk about uh about when it comes to uh time circles and so on and indeed like good, I have good segue thank you and <laughs> uh some remarks about and this is something I was tweeting about the other day, actually. I think it's quite interesting to think about is what is why is so much British sci-fi TV obsessed with time travel? Uh, because it, and this is something you see like the like big British sci-fi TV show of all time is Doctor Who, which is about a time traveling space alien. And you and the, but this is something that does crop up a lot. Like Children of the Stones is very much concerned with these loops in time. Uh, Sapphire and Steel, um, like Fisher writes about, it saying that it's all like in Sapphire and Steel, time is like this corrosive force that's trying to push its way in. And again, and even like more recently, when when uh, BBC the BBC revived Doctor Who, we had the unedifying spectacle of ITV's Primeval, was just about time traveling dinosaurs. Um, it wasn't good, and the. <laughs> I think there's two ways to think about this. Uh, and we could say that there's like a material and a symbolic dimension to this obsession with time travel. Firstly, is and as we have been saying, definitely part of it is a budget thing that they were not producing these th- these shows with an enormous amount of money. And, you know, why not try to find a use for this period set we happen to have, you know? Uh, and this was actually like a curse that the original series of Star Trek suffered under, which is why there's this endless parade of gangster pla- planets and cowboy worlds <laughs> in original Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> and, but I think in in symbolic terms, it's very, this is very interesting because I think it implies that there's this sense that here in Britain we've kind of remained trapped within time and trapped within our own past. And there's something, you know, with sci-fi, you know, is the genre that's meant to be the most, like, future-oriented, but we keep on pulling it backward into the past. Um, and this is, you know, this is inaugurated by, you know, H.G. Wells' is uh, The Time Machine, although he sends it off into the future. But obviously there is within this, this notion, that, like... <sighs> bringing time itself into question as a thing to be contemplated has always kind of like been running seems sort of always been running through British science fiction and fantasy writing and you know it's significant I think it's culturally significant that you know we haven't had a radical temporal rupture in British history since you know Cromwell's Commonwealth I mean if that was a rupture that gets suited you know that gets stitched together again and you know Cromwell's corpse gets desecrated to try and you know make almost like a ritual action to try and turn back the clock so this is something that we just we're going to pretend didn't happen in order to preserve the neat flow of time and I, and you know, if we want to get Freudian about it, and I see no reason why we shouldn't get Freudian about it, this this <laughs> this sense of you know the only direction to move in when it comes to time is is either stationary or to go backward is of course you know extremely reminiscent of the Death Drive, which manifests itself as repetition, uh, as the the eternal you know the eternal present moment, or as the uh, endless attempt to recover the past out of this perception of the past's simplicity and security. Oh, and hence why this is the death drive, because this is a drive that could only resolve itself ultimately in um, the ultimate return to simplicity, which would be to return to the inorganic, to return to death. And, you know, I think it's significant that at the end of the Stone Tapes, the people, uh, not the Stone Tapes, sorry, Children of the Stones, the people of Milbury are turned to stone by the entity, um, you know the, the happy people are all frozen in place. They are li- literally petrified, right? But I think if we pursue pursue the notion of time and repetition here even further, we see that like we're dealing with something surpri- again surprisingly sophisticated with the stone with with the stone not uh, not the stone tapes, children of the stones, um, because this isn't 
a time loop like you would see in some episodes of Doctor Who where events just keep on repeating themselves. This is much more interesting. This is a time spiral, right? Because you know, the difference, difference between the circle and the spiral is the spiral is the spiral is this self-repeating but self-transformative figure while the circle is a stationary figure. You know, the coordinates for a spiral as it, as it extends and expands differ you, know, you end up somewhere else, even though you're somewhere similar to where you were before. Um, or you could think of it as um, as a sine wave almost, you know, which is always in motion somehow. And though you know, the form repeats, it doesn't repeat in the same location, you know. Um, the the repetitions of the cycle of time that's, that is trapped within the stones aren't exact. People move about, they, they come and go. They seem to move with the time with time of the outside world, you know. They're not stuck in prehistoric times, um, but they're these fundamental features or these archetypal roles that always have to be played out. You know, there's always the magus, there's always the barber surgeon, and presumably there's always the two visitors as well, of whom you know, under uh, Adam and Matthew and Hendrick and so on, are just the latest manifestations of this of this this process, which is more complicated than just a circle. And uh, this is tangential, but this is all tangents. This is quite, in some, I'm going to bring up Kenneth Grant, right? Um, I'm going to bring up Kenneth Grant here, who is one of Alistair Crowley's disciples, and arguably his last living disciple, actually. And the reason I'm bringing him up is because in his book, Outside the Circles of Time, and just the name of it should give you you know, reason enough to want to look at him if you if we're talking about something like this about you know a science fiction or cult fantasy about time, and the reason I'm doing so is he presents this notion of eonics of the uh, occult science of the progression of the eons, and he complicates it very very interestingly. And I'm just going to I'm just going to read this. It's, it's, there's only a couple of paragraphs. The ancient Gnostics developed an elaborate eonology involving time cycles and words of magical power. Similarly, Far Eastern systems had their yugas, mahayugas, kalpas and mahakalpas, cycles within cycles. And in recent times, within the lifetime of many readers of this book, a new eon has dawned, the age of Aquarius, known under various names by different cults. It is said that an eon endures for approximately 2,000 years, but an eon is also defined as being an immeasurable period of time, and metaphysics has shown that time is a, is a very tricky commodity, perhaps more so even than its sister concept space. The couplet from the Necronomicon, that is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die, is of sinister import. In fact, as the occultists Afrata Ahad and others have shown, quite independently of each other, the eons are not necessarily successive. There may be eons between eons, periods of time so infinitesimally small as to be indeed immeasurable. Such a Hadith eon from a mundane viewpoint, however, need not be immeasurable. It need not be in time at all. And that may seem not especially relevant to what we're talking about here, but what this, what I think is kind of being brought together here in this particular cultural artifact is this kind of strange esotericism of time, of this notion that we, the month to the mundane eye, time is strictly linear and moves in successive stages, but to the initiate, to those who see beyond the veil, right? to the Hendricks of the world or to, or to um, the Matthews because of course you know he has second sight which is something we've not mentioned here about the about um, the uh, the child leading this is meant to have ESP then as I said this discovery of there's actually a great deal more complexity to time but you have these movements with it but you have these spiral formations of time you have these cycles of time and you have these events and places and this is any of this is hauntology 101 right where the past reannounces its pres it, it reannounces its presence to the present where it destabilizes the narratives the simple narratives of um uh of control and command over the world that we create for ourselves where time becomes this you know like sapphire and steel corrosive force that cannot really be tamed and, and is of a threatening character, and especially of, of a threatening character to to systems of control. Ultimately, that it can that both past and future can announce themselves somehow and 
radically alter the fabric of, uh, the, of the fabric of the libidinal order. Um, we have been recording for about an hour now. I'm wondering how <laughs> I still have like I've got loads of nonsense here about ley lines, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to throw I want to throw this open though to Matt because myself and Corey have been talking. I mean, I always talk a lot in these, but I want to throw this over over to a Matt for a bit. We might want to start guiding ourselves a little bit towards a conclusion soonish. Yeah, um, I mean, actually, I, I I wondered if that if that might work really well. I'm, I'm sort of I'm kind of aware that this being our sort of first episode, I don't really know how we've we, we've kind of both we've we've all sort of bounced around a bit, maybe, and and I guess I was especially after my own sort of rambling intro, I'm a bit was a bit concerned that maybe this wasn't the firmest place to start for our listeners, but actually, I think this kind of bounces things back to kind of what I wanted to evoke, maybe, in, at the beginning, where you're, where, from what you've just shed, said, said, Sean, what you've just shared. <laughs> that's, that's something that's nicely folk horror about that, maybe. Um, anyway. Um, it, yeah, it's this... And it, oddly enough, to, to maybe <laughs> give ourselves an unnecessary additional bit of continuity, this, what you've just said, sort of feels like quite similar to what we were discussing on our last... Deleuze episode talking about um, the logic of sense and this the the the, the eon and, and chronos that that sort of Deleuze talks about there. But I mean that's probably by the by for anyone that's coming to us fresh. But I think that one thing that we talked about there was this um, this sense of stoicism that I think is something that Deleuze has and also something that Mark has and especially. Um, maybe as as a sort of go between, um, someone like Spinoza has, who is, is also mentioned in this post, um, where there's this understanding that there is this sort of power out there, right? That this this kind of transcendental in the in the sort of transcendental void of however you're kind of coming to this, whether it's sort of through this esoteric tradition, um, occulted tradition, or philosophically or through p- p- folk horror pulp BBC TV uh, <laughs> television series. Um, they all kind of share this strange, this, this sort of background noise, right? This, 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 uh, which is power um, as this kind of indeterminate, somewhat ambiguous um, thing that acts upon us. Um, and I guess what's so where people like the CCIU or even just Mark himself in these various different interests, um, I think, respond to that is is kind of resisting the me- the message of Children of the Stones. Right, is that this force exists? It is out there, and if you like, you can give yourself fully over to it in exchange for some version of that power. But there's also something to be said for the another kind of power that emerges from resistance to it, right? So um, that that's kind of the, this, there's this paragraph that uh, where where Mark's talking about um, what what's kind of the message of this of this TV show? What's the message of a lot of philosophy or or esoteric um, uh, hermetic thoughts, all the rest of it? Um, and I think, you know, Mark asks questions that I think are, are applicable across the board. He says, you know, are we being asked then to side with human consciousness against the alien unconscious? You know, do we have to somehow pick a side here between um, our own sense of rational individual agency or are we giving over to this kind of the, the, the Barosian anti-humanist um, universe that has its own sense of agency that's kind of unknown to us, whether you call that God or nature or whatever else. But, um, and then Mark continues, you know, isn't after all, you know, freedom from the passions of Spinoza's goals. So isn't it, isn't it actually, a, you know, well, as, 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 as Corey, as you were saying, this, this, the, this sense of, 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 of happiness, is this not wholly, well, it, it's it's attractive. It's it's mm. uh, it's seductive. You know, that happiness is powerful because it seduces us into a certain kind of way of being, maybe. But as Mark then says again, <laughs> yes, we can. You know, we can say that we should sort of free ourselves from our sad passions. We should try and make ourselves happy. But 
Freedom from, and again to quote Mark, freedom from sad passions is not the end of the story. If it is at the price of, of a happy passivity, a blank eyed disengagement from all outside, as all your energy is sucked or maybe zucked um, up <laughs> by the ultimate interiority. Um, which I think it's it, it's it's kind of it's almost disorientating. Maybe that's kind of the point. How many things that kind of applies to in this sort of cultural melting pot that we've got? Whether this is these the the sort of strange lack of interiority that this TV series has. You know, you, I guess I was thinking, um, Sean, when you were saying about the the kind of um, it's sort of brokenness or the the, the, the kind of um, slightly amateurish or or not i guess not wholly you know held together nature of this kind of production um there's something attractive in that because it's not it's not self-contained the outside of the narrative of of the story kind of leaks in a little bit you can kind of sense that this is a drama the it doesn't consciously break the fourth wall but you're you're aware of its own outside um to what extent you know t- t- there's there's a sense that this kind of very uh, the, the the dramas that we have today don't have that. They're very very clean, very well produced to the point that we don't have that sense of an outside anymore. The same that that could be as true of something like I don't know some the latest uh, sci-fi drama to something like Facebook. Um, uh, and I guess it's you know there's there's, there's this there's this constant tension between do you know do we just submit ourselves to this or you know what can be gained from if not an outright rejection, but maybe a kind of, you know, to, to place these things in tension, um, to kind of poke your fingers through the holes of these things, maybe winding them up a little bit. Um, it's kind of this, it's the sort of final thing that Mark says in this, in towards the end of this post, says, you know, control needs something to control. No circuit can function without an outside. No circle is ever completely closed. And I think that that's something that... Um, is maybe something that we'll have to kind of unpack as we sort of go forward with this series maybe but um you know it's it's a very difficult thing almost to wrap your head around because it's not that it's it's ne- it's never that clear cut nothing about this is clear cut nothing about mark's work is clear cut um and kind of know that you said and this will be my final point um because i don't want to ramble on again too much but I'm kind of aware that you know, Sean. You also, you, you sort of, um, unbeknownst to us, really, we hadn't really thought about it in advance. But yeah, this is the, today is the when we're recording this. It's the fifth anniversary of Mark's death, and I always, I always hate this day, if anything, because it's always the there's always this sense that what what happened to Mark, um, the fact that Mark committed suicide, is always. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of laying over his work. Is is it comes to define it. And I think what's actually most interesting about Mark's work is it's kind of incongruity. Um, yes, Mark ended his own life, but the things that he was working on that time were probably some of his most hopeful and, and most excited writings. Um, the same can be said of, you know, when Mark's, a lot of his writing is kind of more depressive, maybe more melancholic, sort of like this own essay. There's a kind of pessimism to this post in its sense that, you know, we're, we're kind of at the mercy of things beyond our control. And, um, but there's a, there's a joy in that kind of melancholia. There's, there's, there's a joy in horror. It's not a tautology that horror is bad, happiness good. There's, you know, the, 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 all of these things have to be put in tension and every time that they're sort of uh, announced to us. Um, and I think that's you know that's true enough of, of all of us. We can't just reduce um, our lives, our work, our culture um, to these very you know these these these. these th- we we can't control these things. We you know we we, we literally don't. If, uh, we control needs something to control. We feel like we need to control our own narratives. Often it's the case that we don't have control of them at all, and they wiggle around and. Uh, 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 and interrupt our, us and our thoughts and our and our and our beliefs and our trajectories, um, and that's what Mark I think did best. I think that's what the but the, how deep that goes, how complex that idea becomes, is maybe something that this post kind of really and this TV show summarizes in a really well, not a simple way at all, but a really fascinating way that's kind of uh, almost inexhaustible i'm sure we could keep talking about this for hours and maybe we should we shouldn't but we could (laughs) and that's kind of what i think is so exciting about this show about this post about this series about mark's work you know this it's all intention and that's precisely where 
control and uncontrol go to war. Yes. Um, I, I'm just going to say, a, I want to say a couple of points, and these will be the, my closing remarks about the Stone Circle, it, about about the Standing Stones themselves. And this is, and this really is quite. Um, this very much is just territory of what I reckon, um, but I think this does lean into or, or connects with general themes we've been talking about here about the sense of how uh, the incompleteness of systems of control and how they always come up against these forces that extend beyond them, especially forces of time in some sense or the other. And I think what is so culturally fascinating about the standing stones of of Britain um, is they they serve that purpose of announcing the um, the outside and the unknown. You know, there's this sense that um, you know the culture that produced these very impressive, very complicated works, which are massive of a huge scale. Um, um, would have required enormous amounts of coordination, like multi-generational coordination and planning in order to put them together. There is something baffling about them. And they there's this sense, I think, where the reason why we find them so fascinating is because they announced this they announce this outside to us. They announce this thing that lies out that lies outside of our ability to really comprehend what function it may have possessed. Um, they do feel alien in a very real way. You know, there's a reason why you get like the Eric Van Danikens of the World Cup and I'll say it was literally aliens that did it. Or rather John Mitchells to say it was the Atlanteans who, who who had the knowledge to produce these things. Because there's this sense where they don't they don't fit in, you know, like and we have and actually to go back to this what I was saying about Britain's understanding of time and the sense of being trapped in time because we don't have these temp we haven't had these my theory of it being because we haven't had like a radical rupture for such a long time that we have this sense of being trapped within our own history but things like the standing stones announce the fact that other peoples and other ways of living not necessarily better but different ways of living have existed here and they produced things and they and it's almost the reserve, the reverse of the you know the poem Ozymandias you know um where instead of these things being like um monuments to sort of like the tragedy of, of of humanity because everything we build turns to dust just the fact almost that you know they're still here and just announcing themselves overwhelmingly um gives almost a sense of hope that you know that there are things that lie outside of narrow systems of libidinal control um there are things you know there there are potentialities and possibilities virtualities if you want to get delusion about it um that stand outside of that and um Again, like I was saying, I'm not sure if um, any of uh, either of you have ever been to Avebury, but like it's really good to go to Avebury because it's just very strange. And I think that's where I, you know, if there is like a real value to things like folk horror and hauntology, it is precisely in that doing that simple thing, reminding us that uh, things can be other than what they are, and that the flow of time isn't just this um, this single straight line going in a single preordained direction forever into greater and greater control um that it can be interrupted and that we can discover the the complexities of this of the of the eons within the eons waiting to have their magic words spoken hmm. well without further ado uh it's getting <laughs> it's uh <laughs> It's getting late for myself and Matt, and it is uh, still very early for you, Corey, but I am also sitting next to quite a hot radiator, I've just realised. I feel quite uncomfortable now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, not quite sure when this is going to be going up, but it will have gone up by the time you'll be hearing and or watching this, for obvious reasons. Um, where can people find you, Corey? Um, the easiest thing to do is to find me on Twitter at CJ Wyatt. My pinned tweet is links to the Nothing Here newsletter, uh, my books, and 
this project. <laughs> but yeah, everything's there. Uh, Twitter at CJ White. And Matt, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me um, at uh, uh, xenogothic.com uh, or xenogothic basically is my handle on all social media. So just give it a Google. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Hauntonaut. Uh I may or may not start blogging again this year. And I will say no more about that until anything <laughs> happens, actually. I may or may not start blogging this year and I'll put up blog stuff if and when I do. Uh, not quite sure when we're going to be recording next, but we are planning on having a much more regular recording schedule uh, for the K-Files than we succeeded to have with our Bodies Without Organs, where we managed at best one a month. We're hoping to do more than that, um, but it will be life and work depending, obviously. But uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed uh, enjoyed this experience. Um let us know. Uh, let us know in the comments because that's a thing because this will be on YouTube, won't it? Let us know in the comments. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> like and subscribe and hit that damn bell. Um, and uh, yeah, find, you can find us on Twitter at, at uh, BWOPod. And uh, yeah, until such a time as when, uh, all there is to say is happy day. <laughs> happy day, buddies. <laughs> happy day. Good night.